Okay, I hope I um I <laughs> I hope this is working. Oh, here we're here. <laughs> it looks like it says live on Facebook. Oh my goodness. So um to stay in the uh in keeping with fireside chats. What I will say is that um, we'll just tell people we had trouble starting the fire. <laughs> we had the, the firewood was wet. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, um, for anyone joining us right now, thank you. I'm so sorry we were late. Um, between the two of us, like his video would start working and then my audio stopped working and his audio wasn't working in my video but here we are now and better late than never that's what i say about it right <laughs> i definitely use that phrase before um so uh steve i'll go ahead and introduce myself and then segue into introducing to you and then we can just get down to it and just start chatting a little bit about what's been going on through um the last couple of weeks. So um, for those of you joining and you may not know who I am, my name is Chrissy Hodges. I'm the founder and executive director of OCD Game Changers. I am the, I'm a certified peer support specialist in the state of Colorado. So I work with people worldwide, helping to support them through uh, and toward recovery for OCD. Um, and also I am the author of Pure OCD, the invisible side of obsessive compulsive disorder. And the way I'm gonna segue into this is that who I have with me today is Dr. Stephen Phillipson, who I will call Steve, and he coined the term Puro. <laughs> and so he is my inspiration all around for all of this. So I will let you introduce yourself, Steve. Uh, so I've been working with OCD since about 1988. Uh, I wrote the first article describing the phenomena of what I refer to as pure, uh, pure O, which is a form of OCD where people's mental compulsions uh, exist within a purely obsessional nature, meaning that they undo the threats by thinking about ways of uh, distancing themselves or neutralizing the threat through thinking, thought, or uh, obsessing. And that's why I called it Puro. Uh, not that there's not a ritual component to it, which is a very controversial issue, not for today's conversation, uh, but that uh, these people in the 80s and 90s were, and maybe even today, were not given a lot of uh, attention or recognition uh, for people who is intrusive thoughts involved uh, a desire to uh, extricate themselves from the threat through mentally uh, undoing the, the, the uncertainty or the risk rather than hand washing or light checking and things like that nature. I'm the clinical director uh, and owner of the Center for Cognitive Behavioral Psychotherapy, which is a 20 uh, person outpatient practice in Midtown Manhattan. We do an extensive amount of online uh, therapy around the world. So the corona shutdown of the world is not necessarily problematic for us. We no longer have a 60% foot traffic in our actual location in Midtown Manhattan. We're about 99% uh, you know, on telecommunication, teletherapy with uh, video uh, therapy now. Um, so it's not been a too difficult transition, although Occasionally I show up at the center and I'm the only one there out of the nine offices. But um, so I'm considered a world renowned expert in terms of understanding and treating OCD. My website, OCD Online, uh, offers all of my written material that um, I put out to the public in terms of providing the public with uh, state of the art understanding of what's going on in the OCD world in terms of treatment and understanding. Um, and I welcome people to visit that site. So I'll, I'll leave that as the introduction. And I will definitely get your site up on recommended sites. So. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> so uh, firstly, I just want to say, um, you know, it's nice to see you again, Steve. Even, you know, it's been so long, just two weeks. <laughs> I can't, and you know what? It was an entirely different world. <laughs> 
we could right? actually we could actually hug each other back then. <laughs> I know. So OCD Game Changers, the event was two weeks and one day ago. And um, Steve was out here to participate. Um, definitely, uh, we we got to we got to chat on the stage and do a Q and A, which was awesome. But then, I think the highlight for me, other than your um, drink making skills, <laughs> if sweet vermouth were like toilet paper right now, people would be breaking in the house. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the highlight for me, Steve, was probably when we were doing the booth chats and uh, I came and sat with you and we definitely got to interact with a lot of the different attendees um, on the subject of the secondary fears of treatment. And that I, I really feel like that you and I should go on like a world tour as like therapists, patients. So we're, we're for hire people. Once the virus is cleared out, you know, contact us for pricing fees. Um, <laughs> no, but I just wanted to share that. Uh, one of the things we did during the event were campfire chats and they were wildly successful, even though I thought that they were going to be a big flop. And what that was is being able to bring people into a space and on a, a topic and let it be completely organic and, and how, they experience um, whatever that topic were. So that was the inspiration for this week. And I'm so glad you came on as our first guest. Um, it, it's an honor, you know, not it's an only, honor, Chrissy. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And not only um, is, I think, is this um, going to mirror what we did there at the event, but um, it's very uh, depression-esque when, you know, Eisenhower, was it Eisenhower or Roosevelt? One of them, Roosevelt. We get on Roosevelt, and- Roosevelt, Eisenhower came after the war. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I was alive to witness it, but uh, I am a history minor. So, yes, oh, Eisenhower, Eisenhower was in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, boy, you're bad. So, let's, then, let's start pretty authentically here. Uh, Steve, what just tell us, tell us what your take has been. What has your experience been like in the last two weeks? So after 9-11, when the Twin Towers came down, um, I was trapped in the city. I was there that day uh, on uh, September 11th. And uh, actually, three of my patients were actually survivors who worked in the towers. Two of them I'd actually seen that morning before the towers were attacked. And uh, the city was closed down. There was no leaving or getting in. And so here I was in my office. Um, and uh, four patients actually came in after the attack uh, because I was going nowhere. And miraculously, of the four patients that I saw, three of them didn't even mention the attack, even though they knew it had occurred. They were still focusing on whether they were a pedophile, whether they believed in God or not, or whether they were a lesbian. And that really taught me that people with OCD their brain is fighting a crisis, you know, literally every day of their life. It's a biochemical crisis. It's not an authentic, you know, current events crisis. And so I actually wrote an article, which anyone can visit on OCD Online. It's called OCD's Reaction to 9-11. And not surprisingly, my patients are reacting to corona in almost an identical way that the way they reacted to the 9-11 attack right in midtown Manhattan. And shocking, now Manhattan is considered the country's epicenter of the corona crisis. My office is in midtown Manhattan, right in the epicenter of the corona crisis. Um, And so not surprisingly, out of my 65 patients per week, uh, three of them are having a bit of a crisis about corona. The other 62 don't really give a shit if I can say that. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, so I have, to use, I have to use my colorful vocabulary. You can be colorful. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, and this is totally predicted because my patients and people with OCD are focused on their biochemical theme. They're not so focused on the environmental current events theme. And almost all of them are saying the exact same thing, which is, I don't care if I get it, I'm not concerned about coronavirus. I just don't want to be responsible for passing it on to a person who might be vulnerable. And they don't say that with an OCD panic. 
they say that with a conscientiousness about, you know, being a, a good citizen, as it were. Uh, every one of my patients, the 65, the 62, you know, are just continued to really be, you know, kind of focused within their own theme. And the Corona topic has not surpassed their malfunctioning neurophysiology's grip on their historical theme. So everyone's asking me, oh my God, your patients must be going crazy with this. And I keep saying, not in the least. Uh, they are the most common chill you could ever imagine. I think that the civilian population, the people who do not have OCD, are reacting in a much more distressed way than my OCD population. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, the way that I look at it as a person who lives with OCD and everything that you're saying is the same that's happening for my clientele and individuals I support worldwide. I, I, it's a very low I get a lot of, you know, a few emails about it. Everything else is just focusing more on the theme. But the way I kind of look at it is, you know, it feels like a crisis in my brain every single day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And usually yeah. that's about irrational stuff. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> this is somewhat rational. So I ain't worried. <laughs> exactly. And that is the classic OCD response to this. Uh, circumstance. I'm not even, I don't know if it is a crisis, um, you know, paying attention to every different news source. I'm not in any way able to discern what information is relevant, what information is reliable. Um, I know quite a number of people who test positive and none of them are having a critical medical reaction. None of them are in the hospital. Uh, they and their children are just kind of getting by some moderate to mild symptomology. So, I mean, I just have no idea the actual nature. My, my more amused uh, information is that this is created by the Democrats to dethrone Trump. I find that pretty amusing. Or another one is the Chinese created it because they have too many old people and they want to decrease their population. So a That's lot of person. great rumors, a lot of entertaining mythology. Um, you know, I just say I have no clue what's going on. I'm just on lockdown in New York. Tomorrow, all businesses that are not essential are going to be shut down. And um, so begins the self-imposed prison of the New York state um, condition. So for you in, in kind of how, how it's impacted you personally, you're just kind of going on with everyday life the way that probably the same way you did when 9-11 happened. Um, I guess in a way, 9-11 uh, shut things down for about a month. New York City was on very high alert. Um, anything south of Midtown uh, was basically closed off because they're still putting out the fire. The fire burned literally for a month after the Twin Towers came down. And, um, you know, it was a very, very uh, upsetting uh, time. Um, and I, I wish I could say that things are the same. I mean, there's no place to go. We have pretty good food supplies. Restaurants are doing takeout here. Uh, the grocery stores, some items are, you know, on empty. Why toilet paper became a issue, I don't know. But, um, you know, we're, we're so far surviving and um, so many people are out of work. It's just such a tragedy, um, you know, because no one's able to go to work and anything other than essential employment is just shut down. So, you know, I think I'm a lot more concerned about the cure than I am about the disease. I think that the way that this is being responded to is causing much more of a problem than the problem itself. But that's just me getting a little bit political. And I promised myself I would not get political today. <laughs> I don't know. If, well, you know, uh, I share I share your sentiments. And for, for me, in my experience, I'm actually going to put out a blog a little bit later today. Um, I, you know, as someone with OCD, and I, I, it, this isn't the, the virus itself isn't bothering me. I'm going to tell you though, Steve, if it involved vomiting, I'd be in a bunker 
and yeah. you would not hear from me for six months. Sean would be like shoveling food out there to me. <laughs> but you know, next time we're together, Chris, Chrissy, we need to do we need to eat a lot of uh, oysters, and let's see who vomits first, okay? Because yeah, I don't like I'm gonna vomiting. Throw a but... bunch of, I'm gonna throw a bunch of bed bugs in your hotel room if that happens. <laughs> We all have our stuff. Yeah, but bed bugs are real. Vomiting is real. If bed bugs didn't your house, you were screwed for a long time. Oh my gosh. Um, no, but I, um, yeah, the virus piece isn't bothering me as much. I will say, even if it did have those symptoms, I probably, again, you know, again, like I, the emphasis is, I, I do feel like I've dealt with this sort of crisis in my head since I was such a, a young kid that it's, yeah. it's you yeah. know, I, oh, I have so much I want to say and ask you about, but I'm, I'm going to say too. this first. Me too. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. You first. <laughs> um, I agree. My biggest concern and my biggest, probably emotional reaction to this is the impact it's going to have on people after. I know that people yeah. are going to die from this. People die from illnesses all the time. I might die. Sean might die. Sean might die. Like that's the risk we all take every day. But I don't think you and if, Sean are really at high risk for dying. He has um, asthma. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I still, uh, <laughs> uh oh, a dry cough. I am, I am a goner. Um, every time I have a little dry cough, <laughs> my brain just like, you're dead. <laughs> but I ran six and a half miles today without coughing. So I'm just like, screw that crap. Um, but no, I, I mean, I don't really think, you know, like the question is, you know, every year the flu kills a half a million people. I, I had 104 fever six weeks ago. And um, I was just like, oh, my God, someone get an egg because I think I could fry it on my forehead. Uh, so I think I had the non-corona flu. And or maybe you had it and you now are immune. That's possible. I'm certainly hoping that. All I can say is um, even as an early boomer, um, you know, I felt really sick for about four days and uh, it didn't disrupt my life path in any way and it's now no longer a part of my life and you know i moved beyond it so um if i had lung issues it, i probably would have been dead because it definitely felt like i had pneumonia for about three days mm -hmm. and um but you know i am a you know a runner in pretty good shape and you know kind of just put it behind me so i think that that's the way this is going to be for most people yeah. so i i want to say you know one of the things that occurs to me is, you know, us humans, I think we're like, you know, chimpanzees. I think we belong in trees in large groups. And so the way that the world is, is requiring us to kind of shelter in place, um, you know, great for those who have family to, you know, be with, but for those who are alone in a way, I wonder, is this more of a, uh, a crisis or a relief? Because it's like, well, now I'm alone because the government tells me that's what I have to be doing, as opposed to I'm alone because, you know, my friend network and my social interpersonal initiative is depleted, uh, you know, almost doubles the depressive uh, element of aloneness. I, I think that uh, for humans, interpersonal isolation or lack of structure is one of our greatest diseases as a species. And uh, whether you have OCD or, or any other facet of being human, which means crazy, um, I think it's really important that we do whatever we can to find uh, interpersonal connection. And even if that means being right now in this, uh, I webinar i'm not sure what fireside chat yes. um, but you know finding online means to connect there are a lot of you know obviously bulletin boards available or you know maybe there's going to be a new cottage industry a lot of my uh, friends are having um, cocktail hour online and they're putting on their video they're taking out their uh, wine and um, you know just having a group meeting 
through the internet. And I think that's a, a, an important thing to keep in mind is ways that we can creatively keep connected to society, keep connected to other humans, because as a species, I strongly believe that uh, we are meant to be socialized. We're meant to be in a community. Mm -hmm. I felt that way. I, I, every day I've been making an effort to get out and go exercise. And, and two days ago, it was just an off day. I'd had five days on, I was super sore and I thought I'll just take the day off. And when you get stuck on social media, even in the midst of working and doing things, you know, in between scrolling and seeing some of those just alarming, alarming headlines, alarming what's shutting down now, this or that. I, I spent the full day, I believe it was Friday, and I kept thinking maybe I should just go out anyway and just do a walk. And the more I, like the more inundated I became, the, the less energy I had to go out. And it really was bad. So yesterday, I, I, you know, the, when, when I woke up, I cried for about two hours. Um, Sean was there, so that was good. And then I just thought I'm getting out of the house today. Um, and I went down to the, the Castle Rock incline and, um, uh -oh, oh, there you are. I, I went down to the Cas Castle Rock incline, which is a 200 stair incline that a lot of people go on. And there were probably 15 of us, but I'm going to tell you, Steve, just passing people on the incline and making eye contact with them and saying hello. And you know, one lady, I was just like, how are you doing today? And she looked up and then slipped. And I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> please don't die because I said hello. You killed her, you killed her, Dizzy. <laughs> Which I know you don't care about, as long as you're not vomiting, it's okay to kill exactly. the old people. <laughs> you know, I would help her or call someone, but if she barfs, I'm out of there. Um, <laughs> But that, and then going to Sprouts, buying a few things and just interacting with the checkout woman. It just made the, it made my, the entire difference for two days. So I agree with you. I, I, that's, you know, that's been kind of this big issue of people going, don't leave your house, don't get out, don't do this. And I think for people's mental health, um, I don't want to say take the risk and live with the uncertainty because we don't want to kill people. But at the same time, like, at some point, you have to take the risk and live with the uncertainty so you can take care of your mental health. That's as harsh as that may sound. That's what I believe. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. I, I think that, um, you know, getting out and um, interacting with people at, you know, here we have to say six feet, you know, social I distancing, know. Um, you know, I think is very, very important. It, it's funny when I do drive around. Uh, I'm really pleased to see so many people walking around. And um, every time I see a dog, I ask, can I pet it? Uh, you know, and I think that so getting a dog, getting an animal or petting someone else's animal, um, you know, being out and, uh, you know, being amongst the community is so important rather than just kind of being isolated and, you know, being consumed by the easy dark emotions that can kind of well up from isolation as a species. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly enough, as you said that, this is why if you were over a campfire, I'd be like, Steve, interestingly enough, this just spurred this thought for me. When we have OCD, which I'm sure as you know, working with patients, the, the avoidance so avoid, if, if for those of you who are watching, if you don't know um, about OCD, avoidance is a huge compulsion. And while you think avoiding something is going to make it better because you're afraid, let's say, you know, you know, for the sake of someone who's afraid of their sexual orientation, they would, they would say, I want to avoid the, the same sex because I'm afraid if I, you know, or if, I'm afraid if I expose myself to that, it's going to prove uh, my fear is correct. So, but it feels like that would be the right decision. But in reality, the more that we avoid with OCD, the worse we feel, the more isolated we feel and the worse the actual fear gets. Do you think that's happening to people now, Steve, who may not have OCD, but are in their homes and continuing to build this fear by avoiding the inevitable of walking out their front door? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm shocked at the cautions people are taking uh, and 
and in a way, sort of the, the hypocrisy of the, the cautions um, in terms of like, I won't go in anyone's houses, but I'll let my child go into someone else's house and then come back to my house. It's like, you know, um, if it's that contagious, if we're that fragile, I mean, obviously we're all either gonna get it and weather the storm. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I think that someone once said, you know, if you are in a uh, physically vulnerable group, then those are the people who may want to be a lot more cautious about getting out there. If you're in a group that is known to get the virus, uh, not be decimated by it, and, and kind of weather through the conditions of it, um, I think that's a, that's a whole different group. And as you said, get the immunity and, and go on with living. But, um, you know, I'm no, I'm no medical expert, but like I said, I know people who are testing positive, who are talking about the symptoms of themselves and their children and, and telling me that it's just an unpleasant, you know, week to transcend and, and then get kind of back to living. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, like you said before, I think people with OCD are um, almost laughing. I've heard many of my patients say, you know, hey, MFers of, of the uh, civilian population, like, welcome to my world. This is, this is what it's like to have OCD, to be so anxious over, you know, something that is so mysterious and universally and unknown. Well, I have, I have a, an idea. How about the solution moving forward to trivializing OCD, okay? So every time somebody gets on any sort of platform and says they're so OCD about lining up their cotton swabs or some shit, how about we just comment with COVID? Right, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Um, I mean, it is, it, I, it's understandably alienating when people say I'm o so OCD about, you know, lining up my shoes or cotton swabs. Um, it's just a sad, you know, it's become kind of a, a societal representation of mi the misnomer of what OCD actually is. I think this is going to change things. I think this is it, Steve. This is going to be the turning point for trivializing OCD because all we have to say is, really, how long did you quarantine? Mm -hmm. Right, right. How'd that feel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We found it. We found the solution. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so I actually have a question, even though this is supposed to be authentic. I do have a question that I wrote down earlier and I really wanted to get your um, opinion on. Uh, well, my first one has, is, I think you already answered this, but um, there's two questions, actually. I mean, have you ever been through anything like this in your lifetime? I'm assuming, um, you know, the easy answer to that would be the 9-11, but anything near you know, this um the 9-11 i i would say it was not as upsetting as this um you know obviously the attack happened um most people believe that that was the big plan they achieved their goal they they hit you know the twin towers they hit the pentagon they did not end up getting the White House, White House or uh, to get the other, uh, the other target that, target that, that one of the plane was brought plane down, was brought down. Uh, by those heroic passengers. Um, but for the most part, it was like, okay, you know, that was it. But following 9-11, there was a huge uh, scare with, um, what was that? What's that white powder? Um, Anthrax? Yes, thank you, yes. Chrissy. Chrissy, thank you. <laughs> there was the anthrax scare. Now that yeah. that really uh, created a lot of emotional destabilization when anthrax was showing up. Um, that created a lot of uncertainty, you know, in terms of mail. But even that, um, you know, had sort of a cap on it. Uh, this you know, like they're saying things are closed down for two weeks and I'm hearing 18 months. So like, is it a two week calamity or is it an 18 month calamity? And it, what society, you know, 
can hold up for that long? Um, so the answer is no. I've, I've never been through anything like this before. Uh, even during 9-11, I, I got back to work as soon as they opened the city, which was about three or four weeks after the event. Um, but you just sort of, you know, knew that you weren't in danger because Al-Qaeda was not going to attack your teeny little town. Like, sure, Manhattan or Las Vegas or Washington were bullseyes for future terrorist attacks, which was unpleasant. Every time I would drive into the city through the tunnel, I'd be like, you idiot, you're going to work at the center of their target. But I'm just like, okay, look, I'm rolling the dice. Um, you know, with this, uh, every human you pass, your brain is like, you know, keep six feet away. Uh, so no, I've never been through anything even close to this level of, I would say, hysteria, uh, you know, in terms of like, what's the risk and, and, and how the remedy, as I said, is creating a complete societal shutdown. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people, you know, because when you're, when people finally find you, because it takes people a long time to either know they have OCD or finally find someone like you that can treat them successfully. We have so much experience managing this type of crisis in our brain daily. And we also have, I, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I would say a majority of people, especially living with the pure O manifestation, have a degree of good acting skills under their belt. So they maintain a life outside that no one really knows the chaos that's going on inside. So to me, that's been the most shocking thing is that now a population of people that do not experience anxiety and OCD are brought upon them this idea of uncertainty and everybody's losing their shit. And it's like, what? <laughs> What, what's the difference between someone like me who has OCD that when that happened, I internalized it and, you know, didn't go off the deep end, I would say outwardly, um, inwardly, sure, I was a wreck, but what would you say to people, non-OCD people that are experiencing this amount of crisis and uncertainty, how to kind of pull that back or even start to expose themselves and push into the uncertainty? Um, the three words that are very relevant to what's going on are uh, the words anxiety, fear, and worry. And most people use those words interchangeably and they don't really recognize that they're completely uh, ignorant about what these three words mean from a psychological perspective. So anxiety, by definition, is a powerful emotional reaction of a crisis to an irrational fear. So people, you know, with OCD are afraid of catching AIDS from a doorknob, and they uh, react with tremendous emotional distress over something that is not considered to be logistically reasonable. Um, so anxiety is always based on an irrational foundation. Now, fear is what you might experience if you found out a rattlesnake got loose in your house. Um, you have a venomous creature that can actually create a lethal bite and you're not sure where it is and you sure as hell don't want to go to sleep with this critter slithering around your floor. Mm -hmm. So that is a fear response because the concern or the focal point is legitimately dangerous. Uh, now worry is the idea of some type of a um, threat that exists also in the world of reality. But the idea is that by thinking about it excessively, we can gain some element of control over a topic that um, is really out of our control. So worry is kind of like, will the stock market ever return to its you know, uh, prior Corona status, you know, will I, you know, now that I've been laid off because of Corona, 
Will I be able to ever get reemployed? Will I be able to pay off my mortgage, feed my kids? These are actual worries uh, and the idea that someone would think, 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 uh, and maybe even like be kept up at night over trying to gain control over these actual life-threatening circumstances. Um, and so it's really important that we differentiate these concepts in regard to right now, uh, the population has a fear response and a worry response for people who don't have OCD because they're being told that Corona, you know, represents a very real threat to their safety and well-being and the well-being of perhaps their parents who might be in a uh, more vulnerable place. So in a way, you know, the population is not experiencing anxiety per se over Corona because Corona is being touted as a legitimately lethal uh, entity like the snake crawling around in your house before you put out the lights. Mm -hmm. You know, I, not that this is, well, it is funny. Uh, interestingly enough, it's when, when I was listening to what you were saying, I was just thinking about that irrational component and how now the, the irrational component has kind of come into play as something that could potentially be irrational, but of course there's that gap in between. And it reminded me of a meme that Sean and I saw the, the other day that said something like OC therapist would say, you know, don't wash your hands 19 times because your dad, you know, or your dad might die. And now the government is saying, wash your hands 19 times or your dad might die. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's bringing like, it's like almost flipping things for people who have OCD. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like I am completely batshit crazy because I've stopped shaking my patient's hands and um, I've stopped licking the bottom of my shoes. Oh, okay. and And for me to give up those extremely common day-to-day -day behaviors, I feel like I'm kind of giving in to uh, the circumstance. But for now, I'm willing to make those two concessions. I have not uh, started washing my hands uh, any more now than I ever have. I don't either. And I feel, I feel like I'm almost wanting to rebel a little bit against I'm not going to, so if anyone's watching this and you're like, you're not following health standards, I'm not technically rebelling, but part of me wants to be like, y'all can't tell me what to do. And the other day I went to Sprouts and I was really hungry and I opened a package of cheese wrapped in prosciutto and I ate it without washing my hands. Steve, that is huge. And you're I was a like, naughty hey, girl. Chris, you're a naughty girl. <laughs> Normally, I would not do that. I would be like, how many vomit germs are on this? But I was like, mm -hmm. I don't care. And if I get it, I get it. And so it's, um, however, I would like to say that I am being responsible. So please don't negatively backlash on my video. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. I definitely want to ask this. I don't know how much time you have left. I know we um, were going over what you had um, we originally thought, but um we can wrap up here in a few minutes. Um, okay, this is a question I really feel like your input would so great, be great, be so great. Why is it that when people feel such a degree of anxiety and uncertainty, so I'm talking about OCD in general, but then I also have luckily opened up in my advocacy about being okay about feeling the negative feelings of this mm -hmm. instead of having yeah. to spend things to the positive, like oh, what's the silver lining? I don't care about a MF silver lining right now. Like I'm struggling, right. I'm scared, I'm all of those things. But so since I've done that, I've had a lot of people contacting me talking about how even non-OCD people saying how alone they feel and how isolated in their own emotions. What is it about, you know, the three components you just said is uh, anxiety, uh, fear, and worry. That's, That's right. Saying. Those are the three. Yes. Anxiety, fear, <laughs> worry. Then, throw in uncertainty in there. What is it about these things that make people feel so alone? Um, I think that we all feel a certain degree of uh, isolation in going uniquely through these things. Um, 
in an isolated way, as you just said. And, you know, I had three people in the past week remind me because of my own expression of concern about some of the ways in which the world is reacting. You know, they, they, they remind me, said, you know, we're, we're all going through this together. Uh, and that was, that's very recentering. And I definitely appreciate being offered those ideas and appreciate the opportunity to disseminate that idea that we're all going through this together. We're all a, in a common uh, place. Um, and so, you know, even with that, I, I still encourage, you know, the effort to find and, and, and reach out to some type of a community that uh, puts you in a uh, an environment where we can kind of share that reality of the commonality of our, our existence, whether it be surviving the corona hysteria or even just living life, um, you know, in a, uh, a community of, of humans that we're, you know, we're all challenged. We all, we all face uh, incredible moments of weakness. We all face uh, a great deal of diversity in terms of mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. What has been your primary emotion through all of this? And you can be real. I mean, sure. we should do um, a, we should do a non PC video. Just so you know, I would be open <laughs> to that. <laughs> the X rated. Um, Upset. Aaron I've, been Harvey very, on. I've been I've been very very upset every time I hear about new constraints on businesses closing. Uh, it's very very upsetting. Um, you know uh, that. I mean I'm very fortunate to be able to offer you know video services, um, but I'm in a very small minority of businesses that are really not drastically affected by this economic shutdown. Uh, so it's it's upsetting to me uh, to think about you know the the the, the millions of people like um, you know even even people who have children who are in school you know that they now have to divide the potential that they have at home access to you know continuing their their career and babysitting and schooling you know there are so many people who need to balance schooling their own children with also continuing to be engaged in their professional endeavor um upset upset is the most common emotion that i've been uh, experiencing and, and, and very very distracted uh you know by this to me tomorrow monday is going to be a you know kind of high watermark of at least in new york uh the way that things are shut down uh there's a statewide uh, dictate that says any non-essential business do not go to work and um so some restaurants are doing takeout grocery stores are, are selling um their, their products drug stores are staying open and gas stations are staying open but other than that New York is supposed to be like, stay home, don't go out. And that's all well and good. And that might prevent spread of the disease. And that's well and good. But for how long and where's the mark? Where's the finish line that says, OK, we we've succeeded. I mean, I, I read that China and Singapore are showing signs of emerging from this dark storm. But they were at this point in December. And that's four months ago. And I hope we don't need to be on the lockdown for the next four months because, you know, uh, I'm not sure, you know, we're designed, our society is really designed for that kind of mayhem. It's hard to know what to feel. And I, I experienced exactly the feeling of being upset that you're feeling. I appreciate you saying that. And my the the message that i'm trying to convey is it's it's okay to feel sorry for both for the people that are going to die from the virus because it's it's going to be a kind of a natural cause of losing people but it's also okay to feel sad and angry that people are going to lose their livelihood restaurants are going to close businesses are going to close 
Um, people are going to struggle with their mental health because of this. It's okay to feel sad for both. You don't have to prioritize one over the other. I agree. I definitely agree. I've gotten a, a few, I think the things that really just sent me down in a spiral were expressing empathy for people and businesses and having people, you know, write, write comments or whatever saying, well, at least they'll still be alive. And I just, that, yeah. it's just not a, a good way to look yeah. at things. Yeah, I mean, the good news is um, every calamity this country has ever gone through, including the depression, uh, you know, which cost, you know, millions of people uh, their livelihood, and then the crash of 2008. I mean, the good news is that uh, this is a comeback environment. This is a comeback economy. And um, confident, whether it be within a year or two, that we're going to look back at this and say, God, that was really effed up. Uh, that was a very dark period, but, you know, we, we survived, you know, we transcended it. And so in that regard, I do think that there is cause for faith and appreciation that this is a temporary situation. The, the thing that humans don't deal well with is ambiguity of the finish line and it's funny because almost all of my patients no matter what their spike theme is you know lesbian vomiting uh maybe god doesn't love them maybe maybe Thank you for they're... highlighting all of mine <laughs> you know me i appreciate the audience um the biggest theme that's most common is the forever spike, this will never end. Um, and, you know, even when I go into a, a dark place and uh, my brain can, can go dark, my brain can unpack very unpleasant emotions. And I can, I can feel like, uh, you know, life is a very uh, tenuous process to continue to live. Uh, and my brain will say to me, you know, this is your new reality. This is your new permanent place. And the only word for me that really keeps my my feet grounded is the word persevere. Mm -hmm. Meaning just continue to put one foot in front of the other. Even though I don't know when the end is, even though I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, I know that even in this dark place, I can continue to move forward. And I think that's the most important thing for, for all of us is to, to see that it's so important, no matter how bleak things feel or seem, to just keep, you know, moving the ball forward, keep moving forward in our life process. Um, because digging out of these holes is it's kind of like what we all go through as humans. We all occasionally fall into holes that uh, it's really important to kind of transition through the dark storm and you know so for me um that's what i really kind of focus on that's what i would mostly encourage is the concept of persevere well i was going to ask you for final thoughts but i think i think that's probably sufficient enough yeah yeah it's scary when we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel but it's it, it's very centering when we look down at our little feet and we see that we are moving forward. We are bringing ourselves, you know, within our life process. Like today, I uh, I ran, I got on the treadmill, I did another six and a half miles. And getting off the treadmill in this crisis and saying, no matter what was going on around me, I did this for me. This This shows me that I'm still making choices that give me a sense of groundedness and a sense of accomplishment mm -hmm. so for the rest of the day until tomorrow morning when i'm going to do another six and a half miles i hope you know i carry that little trophy with me and so i think it's so important that we all find things in our life that give us that sense of accomplishment on a day-to-day -day basis you know without that life can become very very bleak and very heavy and in, in, you know, kind of 
to full circle it back to OCD, it's one of the things that I always remember. And one of the things that you taught me is that you can still do life even if OCD is with you. And it really yeah. just is one step at a time. And typically if I just get out the door and do life, I realize that I have the strength and perseverance to do it. Yeah. And that's so important. I think that, you know, for all of us, like, um, you know, take that shower, get dressed and go out and say the day has started. Mm-hmm. You know, I have, I have joined yet another day where things are available to me, goals are available to me, and I can make choices that demonstrate that I'm, I'm still living. Well, I also want to tell you, if you ever get in one of those spots, you can always call me for peer support. Aww. I can, I can fit you into <laughs> I, my schedule. At this point, I, after the market has crashed, I can't afford you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a discount. <laughs> So, can I um, pay? Can I pay you in chickens and eggs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, toilet paper and rotisserie chicken. <laughs> toilet paper <laughs> and Purell <laughs> and anti-nausea <laughs> pills. I'll I'll pay you in scopolamine patches. <laughs> so you know, I have I'm picking up twelve industrial rolls of toilet paper tomorrow that I got off of Amazon. <laughs> um, Good for you. Good for you. Before we um, before we end, just if anyone's watching, just so you know, we can't see any of the comments. So if you're wondering why we're not interacting or seeing comments, we had to do this through Zoom, so I can't see what you're writing. But thank you for joining us, everyone. And lastly, I just wanted to ask uh, you, Steve, what was the highlight of being out in Denver for Game Changers? What did you enjoy the most about being at the event? Um. Our, our, our casual after game changer uh, dinner and cocktail hour. Um, it was really, really great, you know, mixing it up with all of the uh, people who are involved in your organization, getting to know them. I really you yeah. know, love bonding with people and that was very rewarding. Yeah, everybody loved meeting you. I think everybody was scared of you. <laughs> And then after I'm, they met like, you, they were like, you're so cool. I'm like, I'm like a warm little pussy cat, and people think of me <laughs> differently, and I can't fathom why. <laughs> I think I dress well, too was, or something. It was such a pleasure having you out here. I think that you, you, I mean, you really made the event special. So I really t- I appreciate you taking the time out. And I know it was very emotional for me. Um, and very full circle, but I just, it's so great to consider you friend, colleague, and former therapist, I guess. Yeah, former all therapist. of those three, absolutely. All right, Steve, anything anything else for us before we go? Um, I'm very satiated and very pleased with uh, our, our process. I'm honored that uh, I was the first in this fireside chat process. I, you know, next time we do it, I'll, I'll try to put a fire on them. I'll put a, a dura flame in my fireplace. We'll make it more authentic. <laughs> and then we'll start 45 minutes early to make sure we can start on time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I appreciate you being the guinea pig on how to make this work the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah, I very much started this process like, get me the hell out of here. I am so zoned out from this technological glitch. Like we got to definitely reschedule. So I'm glad we did it anyway. We persevered. We did. We did. So thank you for being on here. I'm going to say if anybody is interested in more information about Dr. Stephen Phillipson and his wonderful articles that are just life saving, please go to ocdonline.com and check out especially his article choice. And then he's going to have an article called Resentment coming out when? That's right. Um, probably within the next two months. Uh, it's okay. how resentment and desperation can act as a, a ritual uh, in terms of postponing treatment uh, effects. So I'm looking forward to that being completed. So important. I cannot wait to read it. So yes, especially for you. Have, didn't I, I send know. it to you? Did I send it you to you? You haven't sent it yet. Okay, well, send me an email. I will send it back to you. And there's <laughs> no one I know more on this planet than then you, Chrissy, would benefit from it. <laughs> best, best time at the OCD Game Changers event was when I was sitting there and you're like, you need to read this because you're resentful. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, well, when you read the article, you'll see. You'll let me know. 
I look forward to it. Well, thank you, Steve, so okay. much. Always a pleasure and an honor Always to be a in your presence. And thank you everyone for being here. We will be back tomorrow with Stephen Smith from No CD. I will start early to make sure we get it going on time, but I thank you for bearing with us and for joining us today. And thank I hope you, that you're staying safe right now and wherever you are and feeling less alone and moving through this. Bye. Everyone. Take care guys. Bye.